If you're enjoying this podcast and it's helping your screenwriting, I'd like to invite you to dive even deeper into our program. We have incredible classes that you can access from anywhere in the world, live in our special online format. You can also join us in our studio in New York City or as part of our ProTrack mentorship program, where we pair you one-on-one with a professional writer who will mentor you every week or every other week through each draft of your screenplay. If you'd like to learn more or to subscribe to this podcast, you can visit our website, writeyourscreenplay.com. Hello, I'm Jacob Kruger, and this is the Write Your Screenplay podcast. On this podcast, rather than reviewing movies like critics, two thumbs up, two thumbs down, loved it or hated it, we're going to look at movies in terms of what we can learn from them as screenwriters. We're going to look at good movies and bad movies, movies that we loved and movies that we hated. This week, we're going to be talking about Succession. If you haven't already seen the whole season, don't worry, we're not going to give away any major spoilers. So what we're going to be looking at this week is the structure of succession, the way that this piece is actually put together and the way the season is created so that every single episode can feel completely different, but also deliver the same emotional experience to its audience. If you haven't seen succession, basically here's the premise. If Rupert Murdoch were King Lear, that is the structure of the piece. It's looking at a modern day tycoon a modern day king. In fact, his last name is Roy, which means king. And this patriarch, Logan Roy, is sick and he needs someone to take over the throne, to take over control of the company. And like King Lear, he has some children. Lear has three daughters. Logan Roy has four children. He needs one of these children or all of these children to step up and take over the kingdom of his giant media empire. And of course, the problem is that all of his children are spoiled and also hurt and broken. There is nobody who is actually ready to succeed him. And in many ways, Succession is really a show about trust. It's a show about what happens when the trust between father and son, father and daughter husband and wife gets violated, what kinds of choices people make in a world where they can't trust each other, when the trust between corporations and people, rich and poor, when these trusts break down, what happens to our families and what happens to our societies. The painful thing about watching Succession is that because nobody trusts anybody, no one can feel the love that actually exists. And all of these people are the product of a deeply dysfunctional family run by a deeply dysfunctional male patriarch who, of course, has demons of his own and his own past that he's wrestling with. And what they do so beautifully in this series is to fully dramatize these characters. Everybody in this show is awful. Everybody in this show is selfish, greedy, They are the awful, entitled wealthy, the worst possible version of those people. Everybody has some inner awfulness that they wreak upon the people around them. And at the same time, every single character in this piece is totally human. Every time you think that you are going to finally write somebody off, they expose some humanness in them, some little bit of love, some little flicker of what they could have been, some attempt to do the right thing, and suddenly your heart breaks for them again. Sure, it is loosely inspired by Lear and loosely inspired by Rupert Murdoch, and as the show creator Jesse Armstrong has noted, inspired by every succession story through the ages, from Shakespeare all the way to the royal succession in England. Even though it's inspired by all these very serious stories, as a series, the engine is actually the same as a series that you probably would never equate with it. In fact, Succession actually has the same basic structure and the same basic engine as Arrested Development. In fact, you could pitch Succession as the black comic real-world version of Arrested Development. 
like Arrested Development, the engine of succession is a bunch of maladjusted 1% kids who are a victim of their totally narcissistic father and mother who are struggling to do their best. In Arrested Development, it is Michael Bluth. And in Succession, it's Kendall Roy. One kid who in each episode is trying to do his best to save the family now that the king, now that the dad is deposed. In Succession's case, Logan Roy is deposed in episode one by a stroke. And in the case of Arrested Development, George Bluth is deposed by being arrested. And what happens in Succession, just as happens in Arrested Development, in each episode, Kendall's got another way of saving the family. Now, Kendall in Succession is a lot less likable than Michael in Arrested Development. Kendall in Succession is a recovering drug addict, which we can all respect him for, but he is also a narcissistic asshole who's just not that bright, who blows every meeting, who has all the wrong instincts, and who's always focused on himself rather than the people around him. But nevertheless, Kendall has been working his whole life to take over this company. He has a vision of what the company should be, even though he may not actually be equipped to accomplish it. And he's the only person who's really taking the company seriously. In episode one, just like in episode one of Arrested Development, Kendall is poised to take over the company. It's been the succession planning all along. And just like in Arrested Development, Logan decides that his son isn't ready and instead tries to give over the power to his wife. Just as in Arrested Development in the end of episode one, George gives the company that's supposed to go to Michael over to his wife, Lucille. And just like in Arrested Development, there are reasons for this that Kendall and Michael don't completely understand because both companies are involved in some pretty dark dealings that their naive inheritor sons are not entirely aware of. But in both situations, the son feels screwed over by the father and trust is broken. So the structure of each episode, the structure of the season, the way the piece works is that in each episode, Kendall comes up with some way of saving the business. And Logan and Marsha, who each have their own goals and their own intentions, will play and manipulate the children against each other until finally Kendall will compromise his own integrity trying to get what he wants. And this is exactly the same structure of Arrested Development. In Arrested Development, in each episode, George and Lucille will play the children against each other until finally Michael makes a decision that compromises his own integrity and gets punished horrifically for it. In Arrested Development, all of these machinations are played with comedy. And in succession, we're laughing too, but also a part of us is crying because in succession, all of these experiences are played with great dramatic integrity. What's really interesting is that there are parallels for a lot of the other characters and a lot of the other structure between Arrested Development and Succession as well. We've already talked about the parallel between the Michael Bluth character and the Kendall Roy character. But there is a George Michael character as well. In Arrested Development, the George Michael character is Michael's naive son who is desperately in love with maybe his kind of twisted cousin and who's going to follow her around and try to please her doing all kinds of things that compromise his own values in order to get her approval. In The structure of succession, the George Michael character is Greg. Greg is a young kind of down on his luck kid who is related to the family, even though he barely knows anybody. And he's sent by his mother after losing his job at a theme park that's owned by Logan Roy to go see Logan and get a job. Greg ends up under the tutelage of Tom. Tom is the fiance of Shiv Roy, who's probably the smartest of the Roy children. She's as close as we can get to the equivalent of the Portia de Rossi character, Lindsay, in Arrested Development. And Tom is kind of like both Tobias in Arrested Development and their child, maybe. He's this goofy, weird guy. If you remember from Arrested Development, Tobias is the never-nude. 
and maybe is the kind of twisted character who always wants to push things a little bit, who always wants to corrupt George Michael a little bit. And Tom ends up playing both of those roles in succession. Tom is both the odd mentor who is teaching Greg how to be rich. And he's also the twisted guy who is using and manipulating Greg in order to get his own desires met and advance his own career and feel more important in the world. So you've got Tom, who's Tobias and maybe, and you've got Greg, who's the George Michael character, the wide-eyed innocent. And just like in the structure of Arrested Development, those two usually form a B story in each episode where while the main story is happening, they're off on their own doing a related story. So you've got a parallel in structure there as well. And then you've got Connor Roy, played by Alan Ruck, who you may recognize from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, he was Cameron. And Connor Roy is a little bit off. His closest parallel in Arrested Development is the Buster character. He's a slightly more real version of the Buster character, but he's not totally tied to reality. But like Buster, all he wants is to please. Buster wants to please his mother and is totally under the thumb of his mother. Connor wants to please his dad and is totally under the thumb of his dad. And Connor has tried to reinvent himself as a relaxed hippie who kind of goes with the flow. But the truth is, like Buster, he is so insecure that he just doesn't know how to behave in any situation. Connor, like Buster, is in a relationship that a lot of people would frown upon. In um, Buster's case, he's dating his mother's best friend. And in Connor's case, he is dating a prostitute with whom he is desperately in love and who doesn't love him back. And finally, you have Roman, who you've probably figured out by now is the Job character, the trickster character, the guy who doesn't care about anything but himself, the guy who's not able to see outside of the moment and who causes trouble for everyone as he pursues whatever impulse he has at any moment in the story. And like Job, Roman thinks of himself as a rebel, as totally independent but crumbles every time under the scrutiny of his father. He's completely afraid to stand up to his dad. He's completely afraid to actually be himself. And of course, you've got Logan, who's the George Bluth, and you've got Marsha, who's the Lucille Bluth, these two complicated scheming parents who just cannot get it right with their children. Now, is it weird that succession should have the same engine as Arrested Development? No, it's not weird at all. While Arrested Development might be a ridiculous, larger-than-life comedy about the lives of the 1%, Succession is a serious, dark comedy about the lives of the 1%. But both stories are actually dealing with the same problem. Both stories are dealing with the problem of what does it mean to have everything except a family that loves you? What does it mean to have everything except a world of trust? What does it mean to have everything except the confidence that the people around you won't screw you? And what happens when those confidences are broken? What happens when everybody is out for themselves? What happens in a purely capitalistic world? But it also shouldn't be a big surprise because the engine of arrested development isn't entirely new either. In fact, the engine of Arrested Development is stolen from Gilligan's Island. Arrested Development, if you remember, starts on a big boat. And I talk a lot about this in previous podcasts about Arrested Development, which you can look up on my site. But on the simplest level, in each episode of Gilligan's Island, the professor comes up with a plan to get them off the island. And the whole team works together using coconuts and whatever devices they figured out to try to get off the island. In every episode, Gilligan, the Michael slash Kendall character on Gilligan's Island, messes it up. And every episode, the skipper freaks out. And every episode, the howls focus on enjoying their wealth rather than helping the team. And at the end of the day, they all get stuck on the island. So did Jesse Armstrong just go and rip off Arrested Development for the structure of his hit series? Well, honestly, I don't know. Did Arrested Development go and rip off Gilligan's Island for the structure of its hit series? Well, honestly, I don't know. There's a great fear that happens with all screenwriters, uh, with all writers of all kinds, that their work is going to be stolen. 
that their great idea, their Academy Award winning idea, that one idea they have that is going to set them free, that that idea is going to be taken from them and stolen. And please don't get me wrong, plagiarism is really the worst thing thing that you can do as an artist. Yet at the same time, we know that all the greatest artists ever have stolen. Shakespeare stole his plays. Hamlet is just the Ur Hamlet. Romeo and Juliet is just Pyramus and Thisbe. And in fact, his ripoff of Pyramus and Thisbe was so blatant that he later made fun of himself in Midsummer's Night Dream, where he rips off Romeo and Juliet and makes a comedy out of it. Great artists steal from everybody, but they never ever borrow. So here's the difference. When your neighbor comes over and he takes your lawnmower and he uses it to mow his lawn and he never gives it back, he is borrowing in the worst possible way. He is not taking your lawnmower to use for his own purposes. He's taking your lawnmower to use for your purposes. On the other hand, if your neighbor takes your lawnmower and transforms it into a helicopter. Your neighbor didn't borrow your lawnmower. He didn't use it in the same way you did and leave it in a form that can be returned. Rather, he let it inspire something and he transformed those parts into something that only he could create. As artists, we want to do the same thing. We don't want to borrow from the masters and use it to create derivative works that look just like what they created. We don't want to borrow from somebody and reuse their own stuff in our own way. We don't want to take the engine of Arrested Development and use it for our broad comedy series about a family. What we want to do instead is we want to steal it. We want to take it from them and transform it in a way where it could never be returned. We want to actually make it our own. And this is what all the great artists have done through history. We steal from other artists. We steal from our lives. Picasso stole from Brock, and Brock stole from Picasso, and together they created Cubism. We want to steal, but we don't want to borrow. So if you're working on your own series, go take something you love and give it a huge twist, not a little one. If you're trying to find an engine, go look for a model in something that seems as unrelated as it can be and take that model and twist it around and let it grow back up through you. And here's one of the really cool things is I don't actually know if Jesse Armstrong stole the engine of succession on purpose because so much of what we experience as artists is us stealing without even realizing we're stealing. We overhear something on the subway. We have an experience when we're a child. We read a book that we forget about that comes back in some way. But what we want to be doing is not creating somebody else's characters, not dropping somebody else's characters into our movie. Instead, what we want to be doing, just like Jesse Armstrong is doing with Succession, is looking at all the different resources, all the different places of inspiration, bouncing all of those things up against the story that we want to tell refining it to something so simple that we can always remember what we're doing and then allowing our subconscious minds to let it rip, to play around, to riff around inside of that structure, letting elements that we stole and elements that we discover mix together into a beautiful creation that only we could create. I hope that you enjoyed this podcast. For a complete transcript, please visit our website, writeyourscreenplay.com slash podcast.